I've learned that there, there is no, almost no greater hurt than that which is enacted against us by Christians, mm. because our expectation is so much higher, and particularly of Christian leaders. That's Mary DeMuth. Among her many titles are author and speaker. And I would like to say wolves know the words better than we do. So you have to be careful just because they can, the demons believe and they shudder, right? So, and in the world of social media, we can create a persona and a life that looks very godly without having any, it has the form of godliness without any godliness. Hey there, friends. I'm Amy Fritz and welcome to season one, episode one of the Untangled Faith podcast. Before I jump into the meat of today's episode, I thought I would pull back the curtain a bit to explain how we got here. For quite a while, I've been considering doing a podcast. I weighed different topics, I procrastinated, I started and stopped working on this more times than I can even remember. I kept waiting to be overwhelmed with courage. And that never happened. So I decided to do this scared. I felt more than a little awkward during this process, and so I asked my friend Heather if she would listen to me and process some of my nerves as I was getting started. The result was just the right amount of levity a serious subject needed. Hey, question. Before we start on this, (laughs) was Luke Perry the 90s? Oh, serenity now. (sighs) Okay. Um, I am... Wanting you to help me feel like I'm normal. <laughs> I don't think you picked the best person for that. <laughs> Here's the deal about talking about heavy things with good friends. You can go from talking about serious trauma to sharing stories that make you laugh until you cry in no time. Heather and I have had quite a year. Both of us went on the record in January for religion journalist Bob Smetana and told a little of our experience with the Ramsey Solutions organization. Someday we'll tell that story, but on this particular day, Heather helped calm my first time podcaster jitters by having a conversation with me about the things we had been noticing about the overall state of church culture and how we often second guess ourselves when it comes to our concerns. Right. Like I talked myself out of my hesitations for as long as I could until it was like, until it was just too much. Like that's super fascinating too, because like, I feel like I do the same thing. Like I can talk myself out of like, I see this thing, but maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, or maybe it's me. Like for a long time in that church, it took me a year and a half to get out of. It was like, maybe I'm the problem. Second guessing our instincts. We're kind of told to not listen to our gut. Yes. And like oftentimes with the Bible, like, so this is also what I feel like I'm deconstructing is like, I've been praying about this a lot. Like, God, I want to know. And I've been reading my Bible a lot more because I want to know what is real. Like you almost feel like you've grown up in this. Okay. It's like Dr. Strange. It's like you are in the house but then your the house begins to move and the stairs are moving and the walls are moving and nothing is normal or like the street, you know, when they go out, like when they're in the glass world. Yeah. And then it's all just crazy. That's what I feel like is happening with me with the church world is like, what is normal and like functions within the real world, you know? Yeah. But then when did we enter the glass world where things just started moving and that's not real and that wasn't good and that's actually harmful, you know? Um, yeah. But I don't think we were allowed to ask those questions. We have a story of our own, right? (laughs) Yeah. We have a story that intersects and I'm just not ready, but it feels like the time is right for people to hear that they are not alone. Mm -hmm. They're not alone. They are not crazy. They are not just really bad at picking churches. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I set out to dissect spiritual abuse and church hurt. I wanted to share stories that would help others feel less alone. I hoped I could find insights from a few experts along the way. The end result would be a gift I could offer to those who had been hurt 
or for those who wanted to know how to minister to those who've been hurt in their faith community. This is Amy Fritz, and you're listening to Untangled Faith, a podcast for anyone who has found themselves confused or disillusioned in their faith journey. If you want to hold on to your faith while untangling it from all the things that are not good and true, this is the place for you. I did write this crazy viral blog post about it on marriedmuth.com. I I have had spiritually abusive experiences, but not as severe as many, but it came from watching other people be in it and just the shepherd heart that I have from the outside looking in, which is sometimes a really nice way of looking at things. uh, I was able to see what these ministries were doing to people because I wasn't in the middle of it. I'm so happy to be able to share with you this conversation with Mary Demuth. When I considered who to invite to have a conversation with me about spiritual abuse, I knew I wanted to talk to Mary. She is the author of the book, We Too, How the Church Can Respond Redemptively to the Sexual Abuse Crisis. She has written about abuse of all kinds and has a shepherd's heart for those who are hurting. She's one of the most kind and generous people I've had the pleasure of interacting with online, and I knew she would have something valuable to share with all of you. I was not wrong. Listen in as she shares what she's observed about spiritual abuse. So typically they have a really distorted view of respect. And I've heard uh, of situations within ministries where you have to address leaders in a certain way and you have to basically turn off your, your insight or any like red flags under the guise of well, I'm supposed to respect my elders or my leaders. And by not doing that, I'm being insubordinate. It's a really great way to um, cause silence. And we see this in the Ravi Zacharias situation where the entire board, including members of his family, kept saying, well, we must respect him. This is disrespectful. You're, you're spreading gossip and lies. And so another one is that they demand allegiance as proof of uh, a follower's allegiance to Christ. So in other words, there's this equation between if you really love Jesus, you will really love your leader. Another thing they do is they use very exclusive language. This is something I did experience where I went to a small church and they kept saying things like, we're on the cutting edge of what Jesus is all about. And we're the only one really following after Jesus. And when you're in it, you think, well, good, I found the only one. And everybody else is just kind of stumbling along in their Christianity, but I found the greatest church or the greatest ministry. But what that does is it causes you to believe that anything that they do is a part of the sanctification journey and that you must submit to it. Another thing that happens is there's usually a culture of fear and shame. There Actually, there's two things going on. There's a lot of grace for the leader. They can okay. do any everything they want to do but there's no grace for the follower. You know, the the leader can do no wrong and you do all wrong. And therefore that causes you also in your self-esteem to think, I don't have anything good to say. I, you know, they're infallible and I'm so fallible. Typically in an abusive situation, you have a very upfront, charismatic, good presence on social media leader. Mm, And this person has cultivated a cult of personality around themselves. If that person left your church or left the ministry, the whole thing would fall apart because it, was, is, it wasn't built on the foundation of yeah. Christ. Mm-hmm. It was built on the foundation of one man or one woman's personality. And that's a very dangerous place to be because we are told in the New Testament time and time again, we're supposed to build on the foundation that is Christ and not on, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul. That's like not how things should be. But in our celebrity-driven culture that Christianity in the United States of America is have taken the cultural narrative of our world, the Hollywood culture, and we have superimposed it onto our churches. And I would just like to say this. <laughs> Jesus changed the world with 11. 
Wow. Why are we so preoccupied with millions? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's say I have a hundred thousand followers on, on a platform. Okay. So I'm reaching a hundred thousand people, but I'm reaching them about one centimeter deep. Mm. Whereas if I am pouring into my children, into my family, into the people God's put in my life, I'm reproducing disciples, then the, the kingdom of God has changed. They also, they cultivate a dependence on one leader for spiritual information. And if we're only getting our information from one small place or one small denomination or one small stream, um, we are going to be in um, unbalanced. And in those kinds of smaller situations, I mean, small, like, like Hillsong or, you know, one particular denomination, yeah. like if you're in that stream and you only listen to Hillsong things within that particular stream, you could, there could be error and you won't be able to see it because you're only receiving from one source. These abusive ministries demand blind servitude, kind of like this aesthetic of sacrifice all the time. But oftentimes the leaders and just watch their lifestyles, they will have lavish. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, that a worker is not worthy of his hire, yes. but I'm talking about excessive. And you see that, of course, in health and wealth gospel churches where, um, and you see that sadly um, on the continent of Africa, if we run back to Africa, mm -hmm. you see a lot of health and wealth churches of these people living extravagant lifestyles where their congregants can't even eat. And then another thing that leaders do is they buffer themselves uh, from criticism by having yes men and yes women around them. If you surround yourself with people who like you and are for you, and they're not in your local context. So we'll see this a lot in some, some independent, large mega churches sure. where the pastor will say that their board, or even in ministries, their board are like friends of theirs from around the nation that mm. kind of quasi meet now and again, but they have really no oversight and they don't know the person in their context. And they will protect that leader because, especially in like Ravi Zacharias, they have a huge financial stake in protecting the reputation of the one who is providing 450 jobs. Right. If they, if they push against it, which they should do biblically, they'll lose their job. Yeah. So that's really, if you see a lot of people, um, you know, saying things like don't touch the Lord's anointed and, and he's our, he or she is our leader and you just don't understand the whole situation. And they constantly, uh, you saw that at Willow Creek, they yeah. constantly defended their leader without doing any sort of intelligent looking into the situation. And then also, this is just a critique of all American Christianity or Western Christianity is we, they hold to an outward performance, but they reject authentic spirituality. It looks good on the outside. It's a whitewashed tomb and all the right words are said. And I would like to say wolves know the words better than we do. So you yeah. have to be careful just because they can, the demons believe and they shudder, right? Yeah. And in the world of social media, we can create a persona and a life that looks very godly without having any, it has the form of godliness without any godliness. Mm. And then the last is they use exclusivity for allegiance. And that's people feel part of this movement and so therefore that's part of their allegiance. And then to question their leader is to not only leave the movement, but in a sense, you're kind of leaving your cutting edge Christianity. That's kind of, those are the things I've observed from afar. I, I asked some friends, look, when did you realize that what you experienced was spiritual abuse? Most of them did not recognize mm -hmm. it until they would read something like an article that you had written or somebody gave them a book. They just had felt like something was wrong with them or they were just bad at choosing churches, whether they're still in the context or even outside of it, it took a while to realize maybe this is bigger than just not everybody's perfect. Have you seen that? It takes a while for people to kind of have that realization. Yeah, because you're in a culture and you're swimming in it. And it's unless you jump out of the culture and take a, a, a look from the outside, it's impossible to understand the water that you're in. One of one, you know, simple practice that you can do is, you know, if there is an abusive ministry or an abusive church, no doubt people have left. And so my encouragement would be find some of those people and ask open-ended questions without without 
trying to defend your church and just listen, because I think that's going to take some of the scales off your eyes of the culture that's there because you can't, it's very hard to see it. But I also would say, I think we've been trained not to trust our gut. Mm. Um, We've been trained to uh, always defer to the leader and their verbiage that rather than testing the scriptures and going back to something just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So we should be like the Bereans. We should hear what our leaders are saying to us. And then we should go back and test it by scripture. And if it doesn't line up, um, or there's been some scripture twisting and it doesn't line up with the entire council of scripture, not just little bits and pieces of it, then we need to reevaluate. You would not say to somebody that, that walks out of a sermon and says, I feel like that wasn't exactly right. And they went and looked, you would not say that they were just out to get the pastor. No, <laughs> no. if I were a pastor of a church, I would want people like that in my congregation. I would welcome them. And even though it's always hard to hear feedback and I receive feedback all the time as a writer, yes. um, it makes me a better writer and it makes me stay on my toes. It's another reason why I'm married to my husband, who's very theologically adept. I can he can let me know if I'm straying or if I'm jumping off orthodoxy in a funny little way or whatever. Um, That's why we need each other. On this season of the Untangled Faith podcast, I wanted to highlight and serve wounded resistors. I found the term wounded resistor mentioned in the book by Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger, a church called Tove, forming a goodness culture that resists abuses of power and promotes healing. Wounded resistors are brave men and women who are standing up against abusive behavior in their communities. Some come already wounded, and many find themselves wounded again in the process of resisting. Today, I am honored to share the story of a dear wounded resistor. Here's Colleen's story. So how did you choose your former church? I had friends that went there. (laughs) Me, Uh, I went there. Yes. That's my friend, Colleen. The two of us met when she showed up at my house the day after we moved from Minnesota to Tennessee. A year later, Colleen and her husband found themselves looking for a new church and they decided to visit ours. And it was kind of just a, we were looking for a place that we would, was a little bit smaller than we were before and would be more, I guess, just more able to connect with the people that were there. And we know that you guys are super normal. And if you guys liked it, then <laughs> you probably would too. So we visited that one time and it was like, we just knew that that was where we should be. It was kind of just a pretty quick thing. Colleen and Brian weren't looking for a place to warm a chair and spectate. They were looking for a place to serve and to find community. And that's what they found. You know, the worship was good. The preaching was decent. and. The people were kind and friendly, and that was kind of a new thing for us. I had found some community and some people that I could work with that were like-minded and cared about kids and cared about the families. And you were super involved and super committed. This was family for you. Yeah, and that was... (sighs) It was family. It was very much a family for us. As she told me her story, Colleen shared that there were so many wonderful people and ministries at this church. She made some dear friends with the women she worked with in the children's ministry. She certainly wasn't looking for something to be unhappy with. But she couldn't help but feel like there was something that was off with the attitude coming from the senior minister. I think I was teaching part of the preschool children's church hour too by that point yes and then teaching Sunday school class yeah (laughs) kind of the that prime time where I was super involved Brian was doing work with the media ministry at the time Mm -hmm. the kids were fully involved Olivia was at the preschool when I felt like he was starting to scream at us from the pulpit I had noticed it as well, though I had not shared my concerns with Colleen at the time. Nathan and I had many conversations regarding reservations we were having regarding this pastor. He sounded angry. Yeah, he always just sounded angry. And it was like, or like in the middle of the sermon, it would be super, super 
pointedly angry. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I just kind of felt like I was being yelled at. I just think maybe he's just stressed out. Yeah, I remember having similar thoughts like, okay, yeah, you know, maybe someone's mentoring him and he's going to, they're going to like talk, they're going to help him like grow into yeah. this role a little bit more and right. give him some grace. Everybody needs a, you know, a chance. You, there were a couple things, but you just wrote them off as just no perfect church. Right. You know, some things don't go my way. Sometimes it's fine. Right. In hindsight, it seems clear now that we had been ignoring that feeling in our gut that was trying to tell us something was wrong. During this time, Nathan and I had several conversations with an elder. We had brought up our concerns and we always felt heard. We felt that we weren't alone in our concerns. Um, we were told that it was being addressed. So we figured we needed to be patient and pray that it would be resolved in time. We had already lost the director of, of the children's ministry in the middle of the summer, another one of the coordinators also quit. And I think it was kind of just a frustration with yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. The people you were closest with. Yeah. Were, like being moved out of their positions. Yes. And sort of, weird. of shifted and it was weird and, but it didn't still, none of that really added up until, or like it really started, started getting to me until one day there was a sermon he preached and it was based on Bruce Wilkinson's three chair Christian idea. But at the beginning he talked about legacy and he talked about how, you know, oh, if your grandpa had a big old nose, well, you're going to have a big nose. You know, that's your legacy. You got his big honker, you know, and, and he thought he was so funny. And if you've got depression and, you know, you're, you're a mother and you have depression, well, your kids, that's their legacy. He just thought he was hysterical. It just so happens that I have an audio clip of that sermon that Colleen mentioned. That probably came from them overhearing what you always talk about. If you have a preteen in your house who has the WebMD app on their phone and they're always checking symptoms whenever they have a scrape or a headache, they probably weren't born with that habit. They probably watched people in their home freak out when germs hit the family. It was learned. And I started taking notes on every single piece of that sermon after those statements. And that was like the opening monologue, may I call it. Because I deal with depression all the time. I mean, that's something that's happened since I had my my children. Yeah, oh. I remember him not <sighs> having a very good grasp of mental health things and being really flippant about it. Yes, all the time. And then there were those, we were out of town for the political sermons that he did. Yeah, I think that was early July. Yes. And that ticked a few more people off. Yeah. I remember sitting there with Nathan taking notes on, and I still remember it was like, what would Jesus say to Donald Trump was one of them. And what would Jesus say to Hillary Clinton? Clinton, They were the two main um, candidates at the time. And I remember leaving and talking to Nathan and saying, I don't know that anything he said was actually biblical. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know where he got that from. It made me really uncomfortable. By this time, the red flags had piled up enough that they were impossible to ignore. What do you do when something feels wrong and you want to crack the code? Well, Colleen did what many of us would do in 2016. She turned to Google. I Googled and I Googled the sermon title from or the series title, Mm -hmm. and I pull that up, I I Google it, and sometimes, and it still happens now, an image bar pops up. Yes. And I see these two images, and one of them is a former sermon series that we had done, and I recognize the image, black and white, swing set in the background, and it was... Mm. um, was the name of the sermon series. And then there were three or four colored circles. You saw those images pop up. Did you think they were from our church website? I knew this one was from our church website. The one image I saw right next to it, (laughs) right next to that image was basically the same image 
with the words and the buttons or like the words and the the little circles like transposed basically but it was a black and white swing set and I knew that wasn't from our church and I kind of got that hmm you know like a dog that cocks his head you know like huh that's interesting yeah I like to go down internet search rabbit holes I clicked on the one that wasn't from our church and it led me to a church in another state and their sermon archives. And I see these sermon titles of a sermon series that I very much remember. And the dates are all years before, two or three years at least before when we heard them. Oh, wow. So this is a moment you're like, okay, these people did not take the sermon from our pastor. Right. It's been over five years since Colleen stumbled on this, but it's clear as she shares that this moment is seared in her memory. The stakes feel incredibly high. I click on the first sermon and the video pops up and this guy starts out with an opening prayer, but then he goes directly into this anecdotal story about his I'm trying to remember exactly the story because it's been a long time but it was about a jacket that was found in a box and it was given to his kid and his kid wore this jacket it was a very specific story it was a very very specific story and I was like I've heard this story before so then I get this sick feeling in my stomach but I'm still thinking maybe they share maybe they have like a connection So I go over to our church's website, which only has audio, Yeah, but it's still the entire prayer to prayer sermon. And I start listening to the first minute and a half of the one from our church. And I notice it's the same words for the opening prayer. The prayer was the same. The prayer was word for word. (laughs) And then the story was the same minus the names were changed. My stomach dropped to my feet. I thought I was going to throw up. My son came home from school and I was like, go lay down in your room. (laughs) Go take a little nap or go play in your room because I knew I had just stumbled upon something that wasn't good. But I'm thinking one sermon series. Okay, this can't be that bad. Yeah. Over several hours of conversation with Colleen, she shared what happened next. I've been friends with Colleen for almost 10 years, and the impact this situation has had on her family cannot be overstated. So I checked through the rest of the sermons in that series, and I click back to this other church's sermon archive, and I see several images that are, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the same exact Like the graphics they created. The graphics are the same. The titles are the same. The listing of sermon titles are the same. I I, I mean, when I tell you I almost vomited on the spot, I was like, this can't be real. Colleen knew this was serious. She called a trusted friend who encouraged her to reach out to one of the elders. After discovering he was unavailable, she called the head of the elder board to explain the situation. She pointed out the source material to him and he decided to take a look. He called me back and he was in tears. And he told me, he said, I I really didn't believe you. And then I went and listened to them and he said, we've got a problem. And he said, I'm I'm grateful to you. You're, You're very brave to bring this to us. The public can't know, but more like, let's protect what we have until we can investigate. I, of course, couldn't do anything that night, but do internet research. There was a moment when Brian called me in from the other room and he goes, I just found the entire Genesis series. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that was when I, I think I was like more than done. Well, at this point you had to realize probably was all of his sermons. But when we found the Genesis series and that came from uh, Mark Driscoll, Mm -hmm. it, it almost frustrated me more than it was Driscoll because his reputation precedes him. Probably not the person I'd want to emulate. Incredibly reckless to choose such a well-known preacher 
to plagiarize because the odds of somebody have heard that is higher than your average person. Over the next several days, Colleen and her husband found more and more plagiarized sermons. By the time the investigation was complete, they discovered that more than 200 sermons had been plagiarized. While the elders were trying to figure out how to handle the situation, Colleen had to figure out how to act normal while working alongside the pastor's wife at the church preschool. Meanwhile, Nathan and I had come to a very difficult decision that we needed to leave the church. We'd come to believe that the problems we struggled with at the church had to do with the pastor, and we really didn't see any way to solve it with the pastor staying. After messaging a friend on the elder board that we would be leaving, I knew we had to tell Colleen and Brian. So I called Colleen. It was really funny because the first thing I said was, Amy, hang on. Just hang on a second. This was a couple weeks into this process for me. And I looked at Brian after I told you to stop. (laughs) And I'm like, just stop for a second. And I looked at Brian and I said, this is Amy. They're leaving the church. As Colleen relayed what was happening, I couldn't believe it. I walked into the dining room where Nathan was sitting. I took a piece of paper and I wrote two words on it. One of them was the name of the pastor. And the second was plagiarism. Yeah. Within seconds, he finds plagiarized sermons. It took him no no time. time The fact that for so long, this pastor was able to get away with that with no one knowing was bizarre. Yes. The one thing we discovered was that if he, about half of his sermons were Mark Driscoll, the other main source was a pastor in Kentucky and we're in middle Tennessee. We found out later that there were people from that church who yeah. later visited our church. With this news from Colleen, Nathan and I decided to put our decision to leave on hold. We were hoping they would let this pastor go and that would resolve our concerns. They did some investigations based on what I sent. So I was kind of kept in the loop. This is what's happening. I mean, I was going to work every other day with his wife. I couldn't eat. I wasn't sleeping. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, narcissism was the top on the list of what this had to have been. been Oh, yeah. This this church experience was what pushed me into learning about narcissism. As we waited for the elders to make a decision, my inner Nancy Drew kicked in. I remembered a sermon the pastor had preached that had especially touched me. He seemed especially vulnerable in that sermon, and I needed to know if that sermon had also been stolen. I pulled up the sermon from our church website, and then I found that exact same sermon on a church website in Kentucky. And I, I I started to cry. I I don't know if I was crying out of sadness or crying out of anger at that point. Every word was the same. Every place that his voice cracked and he got teared up and just overcome with emotion of what had happened to him and how he had lost his faith and found it again. Every word, every tear was someone else's story blew me away because in the sermon specifically, Mm -hmm. he says, six months ago, I sent a letter to the elders and the elders are sitting in our service. If that didn't happen, the elders would have been like, dude, what? You sent us a letter? And I was like, not only is it phony, it was premeditated. He had to know about this six months beforehand to send the letter. Nine months ago, last year, I was working late at night while my girls and my wife were sleeping. And I realized the way I was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God inside of me. And I wrote a letter to our elders the Monday after Christmas, and I told them that I was not feeling like myself, that I need to lean on them. I told my wife that I wanted some time to reflect and evaluate where I was in life, how I was doing it, how I was not doing it. And you need to know the context. When I was in my early 20s, just after graduate school, I told God I thought I was ready for full-time vocational ministry, but I promised him I was not going to do it like most church leaders do it. 
And one of the farthest things from my life I want to be is a professional Christian. I love Jesus too much to fake it after months of looking at who I am and who I'm not that I should be and who I've become that I never want to become again. After nine months of being focused on Jesus more intensely than ever and after falling in love with this church all over again. Let me admit that while a while back I lost part of it, praise be to God, I've got it all back to the point where I believe what has happened in the first 34 years of my life is nothing but God setting the table for me to preach this sermon series. Nine days ago, Friday evening, September 4th, on Coney Island in New York City, I stood in the Atlantic Ocean with my wife on one side and a mentor of mine on the other, both who have shown me more about it than anyone else. And we stood in the presence of God who knows me and loves me and forgives me, and I don't want to wig anyone out. This is something I've been praying about for nine months. I surrendered fully to the love of God, and I was baptized into the ocean. Every word of that sermon was someone else's. The declaration that he felt like his whole life was leading up to this sermon, those were someone else's words. The pastor showed us photos of his rebaptism. He staged a rebaptism to fit this sermon. It's bonkers. I got to the point where nothing was, no progress was being made. He kept lying upon his lies and getting caught in those lies, but then he'd lie to cover the lie. And no matter what, there was just the sect of that board, the leadership board that just thought he's young. It's a learning experience. This isn't a big deal. It got to the point where head of the elder board left because he said he couldn't be a part of it, could no longer be a part of. Was it majority or was it unanimous? It might have needed to be unanimous. And at that point, they couldn't come up with a unanimous agreement that they should let him go. He was so disappointed. And as the leader of the elder board. Right. And my understanding was he felt like, you know, what am I even doing? If I can't even convince you guys that this is a big enough deal, then I can't. I shouldn't be the leader of the elder board and I can't be here. And I didn't blame him. Every day I'm trying to figure out how to not tell the truth. Where's the pastor? Where's Mm -hmm. his wife? And it really took a toll on me. And when it came to, I think, eight weeks and nothing had happened, I was at the end of my rope. I wrote a very long letter to the rest of the elder board. It basically read to the extent of, we put our family on the line for the truth. My job is on the line. We risked so much. Mm -hmm. And for you to not see this as unbiblical and a learning experience, and I put that in quotes because to me, this is not a learning experience. He knew exactly what he did. The line was crossed. Eventually, come to find out, it was every sermon, including his trial sermon when he was being interviewed. Colleen and Brian kept waiting for some decisive movement from the elder board. They finally decided to write a letter to the entire board outlining how serious they believed this was. And that letter actually lit a fire underneath the board to kind of start deciding what they were going to do. Was he was going to be allowed to preach, but he was going to have to turn in his sermons beforehand to be checked. Mm Mm-hmm. He was going to have to write letters or speak to certain people, write letters to the family because he continually asked to speak to them. He was supposed to write a letter of apology to the congregation, to the family. He was supposed to stand up in front of the congregation and apologize. He met with the elder that knew who I was and another one at the church with the staff. And this was supposed to be his apology to the staff Mm -hmm. that he walked into the meeting and it went a little something like, They were all sitting around this table and he walks in like no big deal. And he's like, I'm supposed to apologize for borrowing some sermons, but, and he walked out the door. And with his exit, the pastor's job at the church was over. Colleen was hoping this ending would bring them relief, but that's not what happened. Esau McCulley wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times titled The Unsettling Power of Easter. 
he points out the fear felt by the women when they found Jesus' tomb empty. He suggests this, The only thing more terrifying than a world with Jesus dead was one in which he was alive. He went on to say this, The women did not go to the tomb looking for hope. They were searching for a place to grieve. They wanted to be left alone in despair. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called these women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift. Hope in the power of God, the unending reservoir of forgiveness, and an abundance of love. It would make them seem like fools. Who could believe such a thing? Christians at their best are the fools who dare believe in God's power to call dead things to life. I can't say it any better than Macaulay did. We are in desperate need of resurrection, corporately and individually. This podcast is my offering of hope to you. I am daring to believe for you and for me that there is life and resurrection is coming. Throughout this season, we'll hear the stories of several wounded resistors, Next week, we'll hear the rest of Colleen's story, and we'll also hear again from Mary DeMuth. My friend, Dr. Gary David Stratton, will also be joining us. He's a Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Spiritual Formation and Cultural Leadership at Johnson University. Thanks for listening to Episode 1 of Untangled Faith. If you enjoyed this episode, I would be so grateful if you would share it with a friend and leave a review on iTunes. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook as Untangled Faith. For transcripts and show notes, check out untangledfaithpodcast.com. On the next episode of Untangled Faith. Um, But often the truth tellers, as we know, um, are blamed. They're the ones who are raked through the mud. They're the ones who are dragged you know, behind the tractor and tarred and feathered. That's just what it is. And it shouldn't be that way. Um, I lived that life for a very long time. There is, I hope, a profound level of trust that's established between a congregant that chooses to come under the teaching of uh, of a pastor, uh, whether they be male or female, Pentecostal or Church of Christ or something in between. Sure. That, that I understand that what you're sharing is not just coming out of your head, that's coming out of your life. It's an untold story never heals. You have to let it out. If you are quiet about it and you never talk about it, you will not heal it because it's untold. It's not let out into the light. It is not something that can be processed. When you're broken in relationship, really the only way to heal is through the same means through a good relationship. So broken and negative community Mm. healed in good, safe community.